willow pattern. Great was the power of the mandarins of old China, and great was their wealth. One such mandarin lived in a mansion two stories high. While common men slept on the ground beneath humble roofs, the mandarin slept each night on a level with the blossom of his peach trees. The gardens of his mansion were a paradise of pools and flowers, lawns, bridges, and pavilions. But the greatest beauty in the gardens of the mandarin was the mandarin's daughter, Li Qi. The mandarin often worked all day in his library, with his secretary, a young and handsome man named Chang. While the mandarin ate sumptuous meals, Chang would walk in the gardens. He liked to stand on a bridge, which led to the island of a large ornamental lake, and watch the golden fish swim by below. Li Qi too loved to stand on the bridge. And watch the golden fish. She loved still more to watch the slow black eyes of Chang, and to drink in his words, as he spoke of Pekin and Anyang and the distant lands of Tibet. Before long, Li Qi loved Chang, and Chang loved Li Qi. Although he said, "You are high above me." Being the daughter of the Mandarin, I am nothing but a humble secretary. But you own a garden of wisdom and the flowers of poetry, she said. You are therefore as noble and rich as my father. Let us stand beneath the orange blossom and promise to love one another for ever. So, hand in hand, they stood beneath the orange tree and vowed vows of love. But the Mandarin, sitting at his window upstairs, overheard them. Be gone, Chang, and never let me see your worthless, low-bred face in my garden, in my mansion, or in my realm. How dare you talk of marrying her? So Chang was banished, and Li Qi's tears fell, just as the willow began to shed its leaves into the glassy lake. But under cover of night, Chang crept back to the garden of the Mandarin and called Li Qi's name in a whisper. Come away with me to my home, which is farther than Anyang or Pekin, and stands among the hills of Li. She climbed down to him through the branches of the orange tree. We will hide in the gardener's hut on the island in the center of the lake," said Li Qi. My father will never think of looking for me in so foul a place. Tomorrow night, when he has stopped searching, we will escape. So it was that they crossed their beloved bridge hand in hand and hid all night in the gardener's hut, where earwigs crawled and spiders wove their webs and silkworms glowed and wet slugs nestled. All next day. They heard the noise of the search. The mandarin servants searched the mansion from top to bottom. They searched the pavilions and the flowery grove. They even shook the last leaves from the weeping willow, while the mandarin himself roamed his garden, swearing vengeance on Chang. Evening came. Huddled on their island in the gardener's hut, Li Qi and Chang kissed, and prepared to make their escape. But as they stepped onto the bridge to cross from island to shore, there, barring their way, stood the Mandarin, a huge whip in his hand. There is no escape! He shouted. I've trapped you, treacherous Chang. Prepare to die! Li Qi gave a cry of terror. Oh, Chang, Chang, what have I done to you? There is no way off the island but across this bridge. On and on the Mandarin came, cracking his whip. It seemed certain that Chang would be beaten to death. Jump, Chang! Cried Li Qi. Jump with me into the water. For if we cannot be together in life, 
we shall be together in death. And hand in hand, they leapt to certain death in the waters below the bridge. Great was the power of the mandarins of old China, but greater still was the power of the gods. Looking down from the mountaintops, the gods loved Li Chi and Chang for their faithfulness and courage. Just as the mandarin's whip slashed the air where they had been standing, Li Chi's white arms were turned into the loveliest of feathers, and Chang's body dissolved into dove's down. The gods had transformed the lovers into two turtle doves. They flew far, far away, out of sight and out of reach of the cruel old mandarin. It is said that they built a nest far away, among the hills of Li. And now all the world knows their story, for the potters of China painted it in saddest blue and finest porcelain, and sold their wares far across the seas, farther even than Peking, Anyang, or the distant lands of Tibet. <laughs>